yes, thank you. Uh, super excited for today. This is uh, really just a, a great day for us. I, I love the Translational Research Day that we have every year. Chance for us to really connect with, um, I was explaining to uh, Dr. Wang, Sophia, who's visiting from Stanford, that we have the two sides of the building. We have the research side and the clinical side. And it's, it's great that we're here in the same building, but I really love this day as a chance to bring the two sides of the building together and uh, learn from each other. And uh, hopefully it's just a, a great day with, with good collaboration and good, and good learning from, from all. Um, so uh, Dr. Bernstein and I are co-leading this meeting today and we'll take turns and alternate introducing the speakers. Um, oh yeah, thanks. So uh, our first speaker is Zach Davis and uh, Zach Davis is, and Dr. Olson mentioned too that a lot of the presenters today come from the Crandall Center, the, uh, a lot of talking about glaucoma research, which is awesome for me um, being a glaucoma specialist. Um, but, and, and I think hopefully, hopefully good for all of us. Um, Zach Davis uh, is gonna be our first speaker. He's part of the Crandall Center. He did his um, undergraduate at UC Berkeley in psychology and then studied systems neuroscience at UC Davis and did a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the Salk Institute and studies uh, cortical development in the visual system in marmosets. And so one interesting fact about him, uh, so for all of our speakers today, we'll have an interesting fact that's kind of random, but uh, so Zach Davis's dad uh, was a developer for the Qbert video game in the early 1980s. So that's, that's uh, yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good memories for a lot of people on that game. So we'll have you, have you come up. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here presenting. Let me uh, get myself going here. All right, uh, yeah, so my name is Zach Davis and I'm a new faculty member here. I just joined at the start of this year. So I've been here about seven, eight months getting my lab set up and uh, we're very excited to be here and looking at how uh, changes in the early visual system are affecting mechanisms of sensory perception in the visual system in the cortex. And by, we're gonna be doing this by studying the marmoset monkey. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but first I just wanna start with a little bit of an explanation about my background. So I, I started out studying the development of the early visual system, understanding how ganglion cells send their projections to the thalamus and how they segregate eye specific inputs uh, early in visual development and how that is governed by activity dependent processes. Um, and then I transitioned from that into understanding how the cortex processes sensory information to give rise to sort of conscious percepts about visual experience. And so my background is very much as a basic science researcher and my hope with this talk here is to describe some of the new directions I'm hoping to take to think about how these mechanisms are impacted by the loss of visual input as occurs with retinal degeneration. And so uh, I just wanna start by reinforcing this idea that um, I think is very essential when we think about vision is that vision as we experience it is a product of the activity of the brain. And this doesn't sort of take away from the fact that light sensing is an essential feature of the retina and the visual information that we collect comes from the retina, but in many ways, it's not necessary for our experience of vision as we encounter it. And a simple example of this is we think about dreams. We're asleep, our eyes are closed, we have no visual input, but we can have very vivid visual experiences while we're sleeping. And this isn't just limited to the strange context of sleep. We also experience this all the time in our daily lives as we move our eyes around and collect visual information. What we see isn't exactly a one-to-one -one input uh, transformation of what is happening on the retina. There's a lot of processing that's happening both in the retina and in the cortex to sort of build our conscious percept of our visual environment. And so the goals of my lab as I'm designing it are first to understand what are the cortical mechanisms that give rise to this phenomenon of visual perception. But an important and essential component to be able to dissect these mechanisms is to understand how they change or respond to disruptions in light sensing that occur in the retina, for example, with retinal degeneration. What is that going to teach us about how these mechanisms work when we start to destroy or uh, alter the sort of the basic fundamental processing that has been 
set up through development and learning and experience. And so what can the second, understanding what changes occur as a following retinal degeneration, what can that tell us about these cortical mechanisms? And so uh, first I'd like to think about this in the context of glaucoma. And so this is an example of you know, a, a visual scene that a person might have while they're driving. And then an example of what someone with a severe glaucoma, this, this degeneration of the peripheral retina might see instead. And uh, this image I, I've taken is sort of one way of presenting what a glaucoma patient might see. But if we think about what the brain is trying to do when it's processing sensory information, this is sort of a little bit misleading. And maybe in the very severe, the most severe stages of the disease, it's like this. But early on, uh, this isn't really what the brain is going to do when it has some sort of degraded information coming in. Uh, instead, it might be better to think about early glaucoma or early retinal degeneration as something like this, where you have a visual scene that has lots of information. Some of it might be in your visual periphery. But if you have some retinal damage, some degeneration for a particular part of the peripheral visual field, uh, rather than having just a hole there, uh, you might know that, well, the statistics of the natural world mean that things don't just cease existing because I don't see them anymore. There's going to be some continuity there, even if I'm not actively perceiving it or actively sensing it. And so I'm going to fill in with my best guess of what that information is. This is what the brain really is doing. It's an inference machine that's trying to construct a best guess of what the external world is based on the sensory information it's accumulating. And as we move our eyes around, as we move our heads around, we know that the information in that world generally is going to be conserved. It's just, and it doesn't go away just because we stop seeing it. And so the consequence of that is, if you have these types of early, uh, these, these early moments of retinal degeneration, uh, you might lose information about the pedestrian crossing or the car being there but you know that in general, those statistics of the world are consistent. And so you might drive and now you're at risk of hitting this pedestrian that you didn't see because you weren't sensitive to that instantaneous change that the brain wasn't able to predict. So this idea about filling in of information is not something that is done as a consequence or in response to gen degeneration itself. It's just sort of a natural feature that we have. We know that the world doesn't stop existing just because we're not actively seeing it. But the question is, are the mechanisms that give rise to this sort of perceptual inference, this phenomenon, are they changed with the onset of retinal degeneration? So one example is, you know, you have this top-down maintenance of these representations that are being built from this feed-forward sensory input. Are those projections enhanced or are they strengthened with some sort of plasticity mechanism to compensate for this loss of feed-forward input? Uh, and, and so this raises the question, is there a significant amount of cortical plasticity occurring in the adult cortex in response to this late onset loss of sensory input? And so uh, just as a quick refresher about ideas about plasticity, generally when we talk about the effects of plasticity in the cortex, we're talking about critical period developmental plasticity. And so the classic example of this plasticity comes from the segregation of eye specific inputs from the retina into the thalamus and cortex. And so here on the left is sort of a schematic of the adult uh, here rodent visual system. And so you have uh, one eye, the right eye in blue, the inputs from the left eye in red. And so they're going to segregate at the optic chiasm so, th so that you have all of the visual input from one hemifield going to the contralateral thalamus and cortex. But early in development, this is not how this system is set up. This is something that has to be uh, driven through first chemical processes and then uh, activity dependent plasticity. So on the right, we have a schematic here. Early on, we've got these blue and these red inputs here in the input layers of the cortex, and they're overlapping and they're immature. And through this refinement of critical period plasticity, you get the segregation of these inputs into these eye specific columns. However, if during this critical period, you were to obstruct the visual input from one of these, and so that it becomes impoverished, then those inputs will be uh, lost in adulthood, and you'll have an expansion or an elaboration of the preserved or the, the normal inputs to take over that lost real estate. And this is something that if you try to correct this in the adult state after this critical period plasticity window has closed, it's very difficult to unwire the system that has developed in this fashion. But there are strategies where you can take an adult uh, animal in this case, or a human, and you can try to compensate for that by patching one of the eyes, the, the, the dominant eye, to try to re-emphasize the weaker eye, and also perhaps introduce some mechanisms to inhibit this, these, these adult blockers of the critical period to restore this level of critical period plasticity and try to recover what would consider to be the sort of normal or balanced state of uh, 
coordination between the two different eyes. And that's sort of what's shown on the bottom right here is this recovery of critical period plasticity in the adult state. And so when we think about what is going to be happening in the, as a consequence of retinal degeneration in the adult state, there's this sort of split between what might be changing as a consequence of plasticity and what might be changing as a consequence of degeneration. And so this sets up this use it or lose it hypothesis. Can we use that cortical real estate that has now lost its visual input to try to drive better visual function? Or are we just going to lose that tissue? It's going to degenerate. It's going to basically take itself out of the equation so it's not confounding the remaining healthy existing visual information processing. And so th that really sets up these two hypotheses. One is that neurons, they try to maintain some level of homeostatic input. If you take away that input from retinal degeneration, they're going to seek out new sources of input to try to restore the, the normal level that they're accustomed to. And if this is the case, then can we leverage these mechanisms to try to foster better outcomes for people by uh, driving through training or other types of interventions of the optimal sort of rewiring or plasticity mechanisms. Alternatively, if there isn't really much hope for that and degeneration is what is driving the changes that we might see following uh, retinal degeneration. So this could be degeneration in the retina and the consequence on the cortex or degeneration in the cortex itself. Then the question becomes, is there a way to try to prevent that outcome and instead promote a plasticity outcome? Can we, um, through therapeutics, encourage a more critical period like state that puts us down a uh, plasticity path instead of a degeneration. Now, there's a lot of controversy over how much plasticity is actually taking place in the adult cortex. Some of the early seminal work came from Charles Gilbert, and uh, this is work from a review paper that he put out. I'm just gonna summarize these results real quick. So the idea here is that if you record from cortical neurons, and this is what we're doing in the top left here, uh, cortical neurons have retinotopy. So as you move in space in the cortex, you're moving from the receptive fields of neurons that have preferences for different regions of visual space and it's retinotopic. So as you move down the cortex, you're gonna be moving up in visual space. And so what, each one of these boxes here is a representation of a receptive field recorded. And as the, they're moving their electrode through the cortex, the receptive fields are going in this retinotopic fashion. Now that dashed circle indicates the location of a binocular retinal lesion that they put into this monkey. And the question was, how does the cortex respond to this loss of visual input? And so immediately after the lesion, when they record now, they are able to find receptive fields that are on the edges of this lesion, just as normal. But when they try to record from where that lesion occurred now, those neurons have no visual input, so they can't measure any receptive fields. And so that's what's denoted by those X's there. However, after several months, when they went back to record from the same location, what they found was that at regions that were previously silent because they had lost their visual input, they were now able to find evidence of visual responses, but those visual responses weren't where they should have been based on the retinotopic mapping of the visual cortex. Instead, they were finding ectopic responses for locations of visual space that were outside of the lesion zone. And that's what's being shown by those arrows pointing at the center of the circle there. And so what mechanism might give rise to this? Well, one idea is that, well, those neurons over time sent out new dendritic branches and were able to receive new inputs from other feed forward inputs from preserved retina. And that's what's shown in this uh, plot on the right. These are dendritic fiber terminals uh, measured in the cortex. And now we're looking, this is what they looked like uh, prior to the lesion, seven days before, but immediately after the lesion, they observed the growth of all these new uh, dendritic sort of processes. And those are colored in yellow. And over time, they saw both the expansion in yellow and the retraction or deletion of these fibers uh, over a period of several weeks until finally they arrived at a state where they observed um, a new sort of dendritic arbor that has branched out, presumably to collect new visual mm -hmm. information. And so in their model, they have this image like this, where you have your retina that has now this lesion. So this is a, a, a location that has lost visual input. Early on, that produces a scotoma, a region in the cortex where you now have no representation of the visual map. And then over time, you have the stitching together to close in that representation, and that produces this warping of the visual field in the representation cortex. And so what that would look like for a subject, they did some computer simulations, and they found if you have this image of Albert Einstein, after you degraded that image by punching a bunch of holes in the retina, it might look like this, this scrambled image that it's hard to understand what it is. 
But through this process of plasticity, you could stitch together these holes and then infer what the image should look like. And that's what it would be on the right. So you're able to recover a lot of visual function, even though the image is now distorted based on what it would have originally been. So this is the idea about how the cortex can respond and recover from damage to the retina. Now, the controversy comes in that you could explain a lot of these effects just by virtue of how the brain would respond to degeneration without the need for plasticity whatsoever. So Brian Wendell has argued, well, look, if you look at the inputs to a visual cortical neuron, yes, a large degree of it is coming from the retina and the thalamus. And that's what's indicated here uh, on panel B, that, that little punctate spot, that's the feed forward receptive field input that is arriving to that visual neuron. But cortical neurons also receive diffuse inputs from feedback locations of higher order cortical areas that have very large receptive fields. And if those large receptive fields encompass regions of intact visual input, when they feed back, they will endow that neuron with the remnants of that visual input. And so you would measure visual responses over time as those synapses become reweighted to account for the loss of feed forward input as sort of the uncovering of latent feedback responses without the need for plasticity whatsoever. And similarly, if you look at the distribution of visual receptive fields in a cortical area, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity and there's a lot of overlap. And if you have a lesion zone, like in the blue box on the far right there, you're going to have a lot of areas of receptive fields that are still receiving visual input outside of the lesion zone. And if you were then to estimate the receptive fields of those neurons, they would appear to have shifted because now all you're measuring is a biased representation of what their original input was. And so you can account for a lot of these differences as not being due to plasticity, but purely due as the responses that you'd expect just from degeneration alone. And so this sets up this question, well, how are we to explain the observations that we have made from cortical neural changes that occur in models of glaucoma. So this is evidence from a mouse model of glaucoma where they're recording from the cortex and they observe changes in things like size tuning. So this is a, a measurement of the responses of a neuron as you change the size of a visual stimulus. And as the stimulus grows and you fill the neuron's receptive field, the, the responses become stronger until you reach a peak. But then as the stimulus grows larger and larger still, you start to engage the receptive fields of adjacent neurons, and they, through lateral inhibition, begin to inhibit the response properties of the original neuron you're recording from. And so this lateral inhibition is a product of surround suppression and size tuning uh, effects that are built into the circuitry of the cortex. And so uh, in this glaucoma model, they found that these processes were abolished so that there was no longer uh, any strong suppressive suppressive tuning that gives rise to this uh, the size tuning effect. And so the question is, well, is this uh, a consequence of some plasticity mechanism whereby neuron receptive fields are changing, or is this just because there's been degeneration and now the, the, the circuitry that's driving these types of receptive field properties are abnormal and disrupted and no longer giving rise to the same phenomenon? And the difficulty comes that if we're going to dissociate whether or not these changes are due to plasticity or these changes are due to degeneration, then we need to account for how cortical circuits change as inputs change. So a really simple idea is to think about this in the context of spatial frequency tuning. So here what we have is a demonstration of how our visual systems are able to be sensitive to different levels of spatial frequency, the, the, the width of the white and black spots on this plot, uh, as a function of luminance contrast. So at high contrast, these surround suppression mechanisms sharpen receptive fields, and so we're able to perceive uh, the very fine gradations between the white and black spots at the bottom of the chart. But as we reduce the luminance contrast, these suppression mechanisms become less engaged, and now we start to blend together these white and black spots so that they appear as gray. And so uh, on the right here, we have uh, uh, basically what is the spatial frequency tuning curve as a function of luminance contrast. And so the question is, if we are, um, if we are at the top part of that tuning curve and our contrast sensitivity, and we have some retinal damage that reduces the luminance contrast or the salience of visual input, that's going to move us down on this contrast sensitivity part, and that's going to change where we fall on our spatial frequency tuning curve. And so we need to be able to control for these types of interactions if we're going to understand and, and dissect what's actually happening with retinal degeneration. Uh, and so in order to address this question, uh, 
rather than try to record from human subjects where um, we can't get at these mechanisms as cleanly because they require invasive procedures. Uh, and instead, we turn to the marmoset monkey. And the marmoset monkey is a very appealing model for vision neuroscience because they have a smooth cortex. Uh, they're lysocephalic. And so what this means is that we can record from uh, cortical populations that represent the entire visual field. And we can do this simultaneously. And so we can look to see how do interactions of cortical populations throughout the visual field change from regions that are undergoing or having lost input from retinal degeneration to areas that are not. And, and where are these interactions producing the effects of things like filling in? Um, and so, as I said, marmosets have a smooth cortex, but they're also highly visual and they have similar cortical architecture to that we see in humans. And so the hope is that anything that we learn from studying the marmoset visual system will have a high degree of translating to understanding how these things might be happening in human patients. What's really critical is that marmosets also do visual behaviors similar to humans do. So they have a fovea and they make saccades to move that fovea around to collect visual information. And so if we're to think about how we maintain representations from information that we collect with the high acuity fovea to build out this sort of visual scene, uh, marmosets are a good model for understanding how that process works and, and how those representations are built and maintained uh, across cortical areas. Uh, critically for understanding vision disease and especially age-related visual diseases, marmosets are fast aging. So if we were to think about uh, a marmoset that's like six or seven years old, that's like the equivalent of a human that's 60 or 70 years old. And we can actually find evidence of endogenous symptoms for age-related diseases like glaucoma. So uh, seven or eight-year-old marmosets are about as likely to develop retinal degeneration as uh, a human might be at that same age. And so this is an example of um, glaucoma symptoms naturally occurring in a marmoset. So we have thinning of the retina. We have uh, loss of thalamic neurons, specifically uh, in M layers as opposed to P layers. So reductions in the magnocellular pathway as opposed to the parvocellular pathway, consistent with the loss of peripheral uh, ganglion cells, and also a thinning of the uh, neurons in layer four, the input layer of the visual cortex. And so this allows us to ask questions. Is there a temporal order for plasticity preceding degeneration? Or are they, is it an either or kind of thing? Or is there a temporal sequence going on? Uh, can we promote plasticity over degeneration to try to restore visual function in animals that are undergoing uh, retinal disease? And if not, can we at least try to restart the critical period so that we can uh, encourage the rewiring of the brain into a fashion that would benefit visual processing and censoring uh, visual experience in, in these animals? And so the way that we're going to do this as a start is to develop uh, further a marmoset model of glaucoma that uses microbead obstruction to increase intraocular pressure, and this results in retinal degeneration. Um, we're also exploring other models to use viral vectors to try to interfere with the function of the retina to increase intraocular pressure um, as well. But we're also interested in other means to induce other types of retinal degeneration to compare to see how the brain responds to, you know, if we have macular degeneration versus glaucoma, are those going to have different implications for how the cortex responds? Uh, so we're going to measure perceptual sensitivity in these animals. We're going to train them to do a motion coherence perimetry task. We're going to chain, test for changes in sensitivity as a function of contrast and try to dissociate what the, expectation, what the expectation would be if we're under this sort of plasticity hypothesis versus this degeneration hypothesis. Uh, we're also going to understand changes in the functional responses of cortical neurons. So we're going to record from neurons using electrophysiology. We're going to measure the, the cortical response properties. We're going to look at receptive field size, size tuning, uh, all, all these different features, and ask, are they changing consistent what we see on the perceptual sensitivity, the, their behavioral performance? And is that consistent with plasticity or degeneration? And how does this change over time? And then finally, uh, at various time points throughout these studies, we're going to perform histological examination and look for direct evidence of plasticity or degeneration across different cell types based on their morphology and look to see if there's any differences in where this information might be coming from. Is it coming from feed port sources? Is it coming from feedback sources? How are these interacting and how are they changing with degeneration? Um, but yeah, that's what I have for now. Those are the plans going forward. I'd like to thank my faculty mentors, Alessandra and David, uh, as well as Barad, who's been helping out a lot. 
And I'd like to uh, thank the members who have joined my lab, uh, Akshay Parcher, he's my lab manager and he's been helping me get everything set up. Uh, Dylan Jensen is a neuroscience graduate student who's joined the lab. And then uh, Emma Rudolph is a technician who's also been helping me get these experiments underway. And so if there are any questions, I would love to uh, answer them. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, very interesting. We in Retina are actually tr often trying to teach people to, to ignore things and not look at their floaters and other things. So there's a different kind of plasticity that, we, that we're looking at. So uh, for our next speaker, I'm pleased to introduce our newest clinician scientist here. He's only been here literally several weeks. It's uh, Dr. Ian Pitha, who uh, did his MD, PhD at, uh, at Dartmouth Medical School in pharmacology and toxicology, and then went on to do a residency, uh, I think a postdoctoral fellowship, and an extra year as the chief resident at, uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. And then from there, he went on to... Uh, to Wilmer Johns Hopkins, where he did a glaucoma fellowship and was on the faculty there for about 10 years. So we're very lucky to and pleased to introduce to recruit him here to join us out here in Utah. And so Ian will be speaking on engineering better glaucoma therapy because he's, his work is focused on drug delivery, device design, and glaucoma pathogenesis. Thank Please. you. And oh, his interesting fact is that he is apparently a very good um, a goalie uh, in lacrosse. And so we don't have a lacrosse team, but maybe we'll form one. I don't know if I uh, get a little help. Yeah, that'll be a tough uh, presentation to follow. I think even the interesting fact was kind of kind of has me beat. Um, that was a really good one. Excellent presentation. And really interesting. Be sure to use the microphone so people are listening online. Like okay. Yeah, definitely. So uh, thank you very much for having me out to speak today. Uh, this is going to be kind of a broad overview of some of the things I've worked on in the last 10 years. Uh, my lab uh, focuses really on, on, on three areas. One is improving drug delivery and glaucoma therapy. Uh, the second is improving uh, glaucoma surgeries by advancing uh, device design in glaucoma surgery. And the third is more of the basic science of scleral remodeling in glaucoma therapy and um, in myopia development. Kind of in the spirit of translational research day, I'm gonna focus on the top two um, of those focuses, drug delivery and surgery, um, and not speak on scleral remodeling at all. Um, these are my financial disclosures. The second part of my, my talk does involve work that I've done with Gore and Associates, and I've served as a paid consultant for them and also have received grant funding from them as well. So drug delivery, when I started my career um, at Wilmer, the charge that I was given to really um, focus my research on was improving uh, drop or drug delivery and glaucoma therapy because it's so limited. So what um, I'm gonna present in this section is kind of a broad overview of a bunch of the projects I've worked on. Uh, some of them I've been kind of primary lead on, uh, some of the ones in the middle, it's been more, I've been a collaborator, but I think they're really interesting approaches to deliver drugs better in glaucoma therapy. Um, and I'm gonna continue some of that work here at the Moran. So topical approaches to glaucoma treatment are really limited. They're not great, right? Uh, medication adherence, is really poor amongst our patients, even under the best of conditions. Drugs are really difficult for our patients to administer. Uh, a lot of our patients are older, it takes a lot of dexterity to put that drop in your eye. A lot of our patients have diseases like Parkinson's or rheumatoid arthritis that even makes um, the act of delivering one drop really difficult. Bioavailability of our drugs is very limited as well. On average, less than 5% of the drug that we deliver to the surface of the eye actually gets to the target tissue. And we have more and more evidence that ocular surface toxicity is a major issue. We know it limits um, medication adherence, but it also affects the success of a, our procedural interventions in glaucoma. So we have really good evidence that it limits the success of our surgeries like trabeculectomies and tube shunts, but there's more growing evidence that it even limits the success of uh, procedures like selective laser trabeculoplasty. So the answer or one answer to, to these limitations, a sustained drug release. 
basically to reduce toxicity with improved efficacy. And the concept of sustained drug release is illustrated here on this graph. Tissue drug concentration is on the y-axis. Uh, time is on the x-axis. It can go from minutes to months. And the way we deliver drugs topically is in a pulsed manner, right? We, we deliver a very high dosage of drug and preservative to the surface of the eye in the hope that enough gets into the eye over a very brief period of time. This does a couple things. You have to administer the drop at least daily, sometimes multiple times a day. And it also exposes the eye to very high dosages of this um, medication and the, the preservatives that come along with it, which can increase side effects like red eye and irritated eye. Controlled release medications or zero order release medications aim to deliver the drug once and have a sustained effect that exists within the therapeutic window during that time over weeks or even months. The advantages of this are, are that it takes away the need for medication adherence for our patients. And it also avoids toxic levels that can cause problems. So the first thing I did when I, when I started working at Wilmer was looking and trying to develop sustained release medications or formulations that lowered IOP over a long period of time. And I worked with the drug dorzolamide, which is a commonly used IOP lowering medication. And what I was doing was I was packaging it in these little microparticles using a technique called ion pairing. And we injected them in the subcon space of rabbits and we measured pressure over time. And what we found in this experiment was these dorzolamide microparticles lowered IOP after a single injection for about a month, which is good. It's better than a dorzolamide drop, but it's probably not practically clinical. But using the success of these particles, we, we moved on to a rat model because we wanted to see if um, this could actually be neuroprotective, right? So we moved on to a rat model of glaucoma where we laser the trabecular meshwork to raise the IOP, and then we just follow them over time. And over time, they develop glaucoma, in which you can assess by axonal damage and retinal ganglion cell death. So we injected these microparticles into the intravitreal space of our um, rats. Uh, we measured the IOP, and a couple days later, we lasered them, and we just followed them over time. Now, the dorsola microparticles lowered the IOP over time, but they also prevented axonal loss and retinal ganglion cell death. And that's shown in this table here. The dorsolamide microparticles with glaucoma led to about 20% axonal loss, whereas the blank microparticles were associated with a much higher percentage of retinal ganglion cell loss and axonal damage. But around this time, I think at Wilmer, I was realizing that I wasn't a PhD in chemical engineering and that you know making these particles was great, but I really didn't have an expertise in it. And um, I would probably be more successful if I collaborated with some of the brilliant kind of uh, faculty that were in the Sano Center for Nanomedicine where I worked. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple different projects I've worked on with them over the years. Um, one of these projects was using a, a drop formulation called OcuGel, which basically forms a gel over the eye. You, you put the drop into the eye, and over the next couple of blinks, it forms a gel that covers the, the surface of the cornea, which increases the residence time of your drop and your medication to the cornea, which is increases bioavailability. And this is shown here um, in OCT. You can see in the middle OCT there that the yellow line or the orange line, which shows the medication does not disappear with blinking. The drug is still there, whereas other formulations are blinked away rather quickly. So this is great. Uh, it increases residence time, increases um, bioavailability of your drugs. Does it lead to an increase in efficacy of drugs? A little bit, right? So when we looked at IOP reduction in a rabbit model, and we use bermonidine here, which is another um, IOP lowering medication, uh, when you gave alpha-GAN-P, which is a clinically available formulation, you lower pressure in rabbits for about six hours. But when we use the 12% hypotonic um, OcuGel with bermonidine, we increase the effect and the duration of the effect. Now, this wasn't for days, this wasn't for months, this was for hours, um, which is a very different kind of duration effect, but it could actually take a drop from being a, a twice a day drop to a once a day drop, which would, could it, uh, uh, increase adherence and also decrease toxicity associated with bromonidine that we see. Uh, but we also wanted to look at neuroprotection. And we didn't use bromonidine um, for this model. We used a uh, neuroprotective drug that's a kinase inhibitor called sunitinib. 
And we formulated that in the OcuGel, and we actually went and used a rat model again, but we used a rat model of optic nerve crush, and we gave the Oc OcuGel with sunitinib or sunitin gel once a week. And then we crushed the nerve, and a couple of weeks later, we looked for protection in terms of retinal ganglion cell loss and axonal damage. And what we saw was that once a week sunetin gel was neuroprotective in this model. So one drop a week of this neuroprotective agent um, conferred uh, neuroprotection in glaucoma. As part of this project, um, Dr. Ensign, who was my main collaborator in this, uh, became interested in melanin binding of drugs. Um, now, melanin binding affects pharmacokinetics all over the body, but especially in the eye, where you have these little depots of melanin. And as part of this project, we did an experiment where we looked at drug levels in C57 black mice, which have pigment, and then a mutant mouse that doesn't have any pigment. And what we found was increased levels of the sunitinib in the black mice or the pigmented mice compared to the non-pigmented mice. So we came up with this kind of theory that maybe we could use melanin as a depot for sustained release of medications over time. So you give your medication, they all go to the melanin and kind of stick there and then slowly release over time. And um, Dr. Ensign and really a brilliant PhD student at the time came up with a really unique way of doing this. So they developed a super learning based AI method to identify peptides that were not only um, highly melanin binding, but the, that were non-toxic and can, could also penetrate the cells so they could get in the cells to bind the melanin. And through multiple iterations of the AI method and validation of that method, they identified and validated a lead peptide called HR97 that had a bind, high binding affinity and a low dissociation constant from melanin. And we wanted to test whether linking drugs to this HR97 allowed them to become a depot for sustained release in the eye. So we linked it uh, to different drugs and we tested them in, in vivo. So the first thing we did, we went back to the rabbit and we went back to bromonidine, which was IOP lowering medication and we looked at the pressure reducing capabilities of this uh, HR97 bromonidine. Uh, if you give a rabbit a bromonidine drop, it lowers the pressure again for several hours. Um, but then we also injected the bromonidine into the anterior chamber of the eye. And when that happens, uh, you actually lower the IOP in a rabbit eye for about a week or at least several days. Bromonidine in itself is uh, pigment binding, so it can create a little depot for sustained release over time. But when we injected the HR97 conjugated to bromonidine, we got over two weeks of IOP reduction. And if you look at the area of curve of the IOP reduction over time, you can see that if you compare the HR97 bromonidine versus the bromonidine, you have orders of magnitude more IOP reduction using that pigment binding pigment or peptide. So this was promising. The HR97 seemed to create a little depot by binding to the, the pigment in, in the rabbit eye that released bromonidine over time and allowed sustained IOP reduction and enhanced IOP reduction as well. Again, we went and looked at neuroprotection, and this time we linked HR97 to sudentinib and formulated it, it into a gel. So it was called HR97 sudentinib gel. And we went back to our rat model and we went to optic nerve crush and this was a nice experimental design where we loaded the rat up with daily drops of sunitinib gel for about seven days. And then we performed optic nerve crush. So we either performed optic nerve crush immediately after giving the um, last dose of sunitinib gel, or we waited over time. We waited one week, we waited two weeks, we waited a month. And what we found was that even if we waited two weeks after the last dose of sudent and gel, we still detected neuroprotective activity. So it was still able to maintain um, therapeutic levels in the eye for at least two to four weeks after um, its last delivery. Now we didn't see uh, neuroprotection if we waited four weeks. So there was kind of a, a, a point at which the concentration went down enough. So there wasn't neuroprotection. But this is an interesting approach to um, drug delivery and using kind of uh, tissue or um, uh, tissue depots in the body 
to achieve sustained release medications is something that's very interesting to me in the future here. Not necessarily melanin though. Um, this is a project that might continue in, at the Moran or probably will continue at the Moran. Um, and we're really going from sustained release of medications to targeted delivery. And the question I'd really ask you is in glaucoma, uh, how many cells do you think we're trying to target at any one point in time? So that's probably a function of the target cell. And it's also the, a function of the condition of each of those individual cells at any one point in time. How many are sick? How many are dying? So the answer to this in glaucoma is probably not a lot of cells, right? Um, Francis uh, Cordero has looked um, at dying cells in human retina. She has a, a label that she can look in vivo in patients and identify dying cells in glaucoma patients. And if you look at someone who's progressive glaucoma, so who's, who's losing vision from glaucoma and look for those dying cells, she identifies maybe 20, maybe 40 in the retina, right? So at any one point, if they're looking for cells that are dying, they're not finding hundreds of thousands or even thousands. They're probably finding less than 100 of sick cells that are dying. So that kind of leads to this conclusion that you know, even in sustained delivery methods, we're really bathing our off-target cells in medication without any kind of therapeutic benefit. And we're probably causing problems um, or putting the patient at increased risk of toxicity by doing that. So that brings me to a, a type of nanoparticle polymer called a dendromer um, that has been developed and, and really characterized by um, Dr. Conan at the Center for Nanomedicine at Wilmer. And he's discovered a very specific kind of dendromer that's hydroxyl terminated that has this really interesting characteristic that it's taken up by activated microglial cells in all types of inflammation, but especially in neuroinflammation that occurs in glaucoma, right? And the great thing about these dendromers is that they're non-cytotoxic, they're cleared intact, and that whole surface of the dendromer can be uh, linked to different things. It can be linked to fluorescent markers, but it can also be linked to medications, right? And we can deliver these little depots of medications to activated neuroinflammatory cells. Um, another great thing about the dendromers is that they've been widely val validated in over 50 disease models in six species, and they're actually in clinical trials to treat COVID and CNV. So a lot of different uses. So for this project, we took dendromers that were linked with a fluorescent marker that's red called sci-fi in this um, in these slides. And again, we went with this laser model. We lasered our rats, and then we injected them intravitreally about seven days later with uh, the dendromer, uh, a point at which they would have neuroinflammation. And then we took the retinas out and looked to see if the dendromers were absorbed selectively. So you can see in the non-glaucomatous eye, you don't see any red, right? Uh, none of the dendromers were taken up, but in the glaucomatous eyes, you see all those little red dots. And we did a lot to characterize the uptake of these dendromers and showed that they're uptake in, in activated microglial cells. We looked at the kinetics of it, and we looked at you know, how the dendromers are uptaken, whether you deliver them systemically or intravitreally. And I'm not going to go over any of that, because what we really want to know is, could this be a therapeutic for glaucoma? And uh, to answer that question, we went with what was easy, what was already available, and they had a dendromer that was linked to N-acetylcysteine, which is an anti-inflammatory antioxidant molecule. So again, we did the same experiment. We lasered the rats. We injected them seven days later. We took out the retina, and we looked for inflammatory markers and basically showed that the dendromers compared to the dendromers linked to N-acetylcysteine compared to just N-acetylcysteine alone did a better job at decreasing in inflammation in the retina. And then when we did the retinal neuroprotection experiment, um, we showed that dendromers were actually neuroprotective um, when linked to N-acetylcysteine. And so this is a project uh, I, I plan to continue here. Uh, we have different dendromer um, generations with different functionalities that we'd like to explore. Um, and then the question is how to deliver the, medic the dendromers and also what to link them to in terms of medications. But in summary of this part of the presentation, ophthalmic drug delivery can be enhanced in a number of different ways, right? And improving delivery really enhances the therapeutic efficacy of drugs. And it can also decrease toxicity. A lot of collaborators in these projects like to highlight Laura Ensign, Justin Haynes, Dr. Kanan, and Kunal Parikh um, at the Center for Nanomedicine. 
and our, our funders for, for a lot of those projects. So the next part of my talk, I'd like to talk about glaucoma surgery. And uh, my lab really looks at uh, modifying biomaterials to enhance the efficacy of glaucoma surgery. So one of the main types of glaucoma surgery that we do is called filtering surgery. And let me tell you, it's not great. What we're trying to do is create a vent for pressure to be released from the eye. And we can do that in a variety of different ways. We can do something called a trabeculectomy, where we just modify the structure of the eye to create that vent. And sometimes we actually put these tube shunts in that, that kind of artificially create that vent as well. But what we know, and all clinicians and surgeons who do glaucoma surgery knows, is that um, these surgeries fail. And the major reason that these surgeries fail is fibrosis. Uh, so if you do a tube shunt, about 40% of them are going to fail over the next five years. If you do a trabeculectomy, a lot of those are going to fail pretty rapidly. Um, so when we do a surgery, we're often thinking of what's the next surgery that we're going to do? Um, and, and how are we going to uh, respond to this surgery failing down the road? So the, the course is usually, you know, we have, a, we have a patient with a pressure that's too high. They're in the red zone here. Uh, we do our surgical invent intervention. Things look great for a while, but that fibrosis occurs. It scars up that vent, and the pressure goes back up, and the patient continues to lose vision. Now, this is a known problem, and there have been solutions that have been proposed and then solutions that are being used. There's a type of surgery called MIG surgery or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. Is it the answer? No, probably not. Um, what MIG surgery do, does is it improves the safety of our surgeries, it leads to a rapid recovery, but there's less IOP reduction with MIG surgery. And MIG surgery is a really exciting field in glaucoma. We're using a lot of interesting designs, a lot of new materials, and a lot of inventive ways to lower the pressure. But essentially, it's not being found to lower the IOP as much as our traditional um, glaucoma surgeries. And that balance of safety versus efficacy is something that's known. So this is a, a quote from a review by Dr. Getty um, from Baskin Palmer, where he kind of summarizes it really well. He says, increased efficacy of glaucoma procedures generally occurs at the cost of higher risk of surgical complications. And that's known, and that comes with um, several kind of in intrinsic um, factors that affect our patients. So with these MIG surgeries, there's this really disproportionate benefit to those people who are at the lower risk of blindness from glaucoma. By performing glaucoma surgery, we can get people off drops. But you know, if, if you're about to go blind from glau um, glaucoma, uh, MIG surgery might not lower the pressure enough to prevent that blindness. So I also think there's a disproportionate risk burden of complications and failure in patients at the greatest risk of blindness because they're, they're kind of dependent on these filtering surgeries that have more issues. And these are the people that I want to help. So what's the ideal glaucoma surgery? The ideal glaucoma surgery is you have a patient, high pressure, you do the surgical intervention, it gets them at a great pressure. It does that safely, it's durable, and it offers a really significant IOP reduction. There are a lot of other things I would, you know, put on my wish list for the ideal glaucoma surgery, but if it's durable, significant, and safe, um, I, I'd be happy. I would be thrilled with that type of surgery. So how are we going to get there with filtering surgery? Uh, one way we could possibly do that is by modifying the biomaterials that we use in glaucoma surgery. And one project I've been involved in, uh, geez, since about 2017, is working with the company uh, that makes Gore-Tex um, to test their materials in glaucoma surgery. So Gore-Tex is a polymer called EPTFE. It, it's a really interesting polymer. It's used all over the place, right? Um, it's stable, it, it's tunable, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And it's very biocompatible. It's used in a lot of medical implants now. Um, when I say it's tunable, I say the ultra structure is highly tunable. So if you look at, if you zoom into Gore-Tex, it has this basic structure of having fibrils and nodes. And you can tune the spacing of those fibrils and nodes to get different effects. Um, in the terms of biology, you can open up those fibrils and nodes and allow cells to grow into them, or you can make them very tight and allow or and completely exclude cellular ingrowth. And by modifying that, you can kind of get a different biological response. So the hypothesis that a team from Gore came up with was that by allowing cellular integration, 
into a device. A uh, subconjunctival EPTFE implant would reduce fibrosis and maintain tissue porosity. It would keep that vent open. So we tested this. Uh, we did some proof of concept experiments. They gave us little implants that were made of silicon and little ones that were made of EPTFE and we put them in rabbit eyes. And this EPTFE had a very specific structure in that the outside of this EPTFE balloon here that we were putting in those eyes had an open structure that allowed cellular integration. But then it, it sat on a tight layer where cells were completely excluded out of, but aqueous humor could kind of vent out of there. So basically the plan was to put these little balloons in, allow the cells to grow into the outer layer of the balloon and just have it be a sponge for fluid to uh, seep out of and vent out of. So we did the experiment. Uh, we looked at the amount of scar tissue that was formed around these implants in the silicon control um, implants, which are shown here after one, two, and three months, we had a very thick capsule with a lot of scar tissue. And the EPTFE um, implants, which are shown here as high, the, the capsule thickness was much, much thinner. But we were left with a little bit of a mystery here in that the um, capsule around the control implants was actually thinner than we thought it was. So we, we were kind of scratching our heads about that. But then we, we did some reading and came up with a theory of why that was. So blood geometry is important in glaucoma. Uh, we know as glaucoma surgeons or the glaucoma surgeons in the room that uh, a low diffuse bleb or a low diffuse vent is really clinically successful, okay? You have a higher um, chance of having a sustained significant IOP reduction if you have a low diffuse bleb. This has been supported with computational modeling by groups in Australia that show that kind of biomechanically low diffuse blebs um, are advantageous as well. If you go back to the early 2000s, there was actually um, a, a group of engineers who came up with this theory that the capsular thickness or the thickness of the scar tissue around our devices is proportional to the radius of curvature. And they came up with this awesome graph here, right? Which was developed in monkey eyes, rabbit eyes, human eyes by looking at the thickness of capsule um, around devices of different radiuses of curvature. And you can see that there's this linear relationship. As a device gets bigger, as it has a larger radius of curvature, the, the scar tissue around it gets thicker. And the theory is that as you get a larger radius of curvature, there's more mechanical tension in the wall of your capsule. So the body compensates for that mechanical tension by increasing the thickness of the capsule. And when we actually took the radius of curvature of our experimental device, and we looked at the silicon control, it landed right on that line. But when we looked at our Gore-Tex device, it decoupled, it was much thinner um, than would be predict uh, predicted. So the theory that we have right now is that the EPTFE, by allowing the cellular integration, decouples the capsular thickness um, from the radius of curvature and can create a thinner, more porous capsule. But we really haven't addressed what the porosity of the capsule was. So we came up with an, another experimental way to test this. We implanted these devices in rabbit eyes, and then we took a needle after about a month and cannulated, went into the eye and cannulated the tube and pumped up that bleb. Um, and we'd pump it up uh, to a certain pressure and then just kind of stop pumping. and um, see if it maintain its pressure. So if you pump air into a, a radial tire, right, um, it maintains its pressure because it's not leaking fluid or air out of it. But if it's leaky, you should see that pressure decrease over time. And that's what we saw. So with our silicon implant, once we stopped pumping there, it really maintained that solid pressure over time. But with the EPTFE, it lost pressure. It was a leaky balloon. Um, and you can actually see this when we look at the fluorescein that we pump these blebs full of, right? If you look at the silicon one that's on the top, um, the, the fluorescein stays within the, the limits of the actual outline of the device. But if you look at the EPTFE, you can see that the fluorescein is leaking outside the device um, because it's a permeable capsule. So uh, in conclusion of this part, uh, you know, uh, this EPTFE implant uh, creates a permeable and thin capsule that's kind of independent of the radius of curvature and aqueous humor exposure, at least in a rabbit model. 
we actually have early feasibility studies in humans that are underway um, happening in the Dominican Republic. And uh, we'll continue to work with, or we're on track to continue to work with Gore-Tex and Gore um, on some early studies to try to get FDA approval for this um, device down the road. So acknowledgements for this section. Uh, my main collaborator uh, at Hopkins on this project was Amanda Bickett, who was an assistant professor. It was nice to have um, kind of two junior faculty working on the same projects. Uh, we, we could kind of commiserate with each, with each other and support each other. She continues to work on this project. She's at Michigan now, um, and she, she has some other arms of this project that she's working on. Uh, we had a very helpful advisory count, uh, council for our project, um, and the EFS team is in the Dominican, Juan Valle, um, is doing those surgeries. And of course, uh, this is a very short list of the people at Gore who've been involved in it, um, but this is the kind of the core team. So um, thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about any okay, great. <laughs> Um So Adam Dubas is our next speaker. He uh, is also a new part of the Crandall Center uh, for Glaucoma Research. He did his PhD in cell biology from Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, he worked on OCT and adaptive optics um, to study the macula. And then he did a postdoc in physics at the University of Galloway in Ireland and a postdoc at the Department of Ophthalmology at the Duke Medical School. Uh, he was previously working at University College London, and he worked in the as a professor of digital health enterprise. Um, and he's here. He's today. His his talk is about uh, improving AI robustness for ophthalmic clinical support, and he's pre-recorded his talk. Um, an interesting fact about him is that he switched careers from microbiology to engineering after finding out that he was colorblind and worked on uh, developing in a lab, developing gene therapy for color vision deficiencies. So I'd like to ask him more questions about that, but he's not here to, we'll have to ask him sometime to remember that. Okay. There we are. So, yep. So we, can we see, can we hear me as well? Yes. Okay. I don't, I don't hear any uh, echoing on my side. So uh, thank you for uh, having me talk. Uh, one of my students is currently defending their PhD uh, here in London. Uh, it's been a lot of great work, some of which I'll talk about today. Uh, so I'm, I had to be in London for that. Uh, so it's been really great to get to meet everyone at, at the Moran over the last couple of months and talk about a little bit of some of the processes that my group is working on and where I hope to go. Uh, as, far, as far as uh, financial um, considerations, um, I am a uh, non-executive director of Deep Eye Medical, uh, some of the technologies I'll be discussing today. Uh, and I also have a number of patents of which that I'm going to be discussing uh, the parts of them today. So over the last about six or eight years, there's been a lot of in, uh, publicity about how artificial intelligence was going to uh, replace doctors and was going to completely append how uh, medical practice is done. Uh, you know, some of these great papers and people talked about by, 23, by 2023, 2024, uh, that doctors would become obsolete and that computers would have taken over. Uh, I think that we can all agree that those were uh, very salacious um, sayings and that, uh, you know, computer vision and artificial intelligence has a long way to go. And at least personally, I think that uh, the doctors are, have, have a long way to go. But what I'd like to talk today is about some of the work that my group has been doing to help uh, improve the confidence and improve the ability for artificial intelligence algorithms to work. So a couple of the things that are gonna be important as I get into the more uh, technical of what we actually did, uh, people throw around terms like machine learning, deep learning, uh, and they don't actually always mean exactly the same thing. And it's very important to understand the differences between them. You know, For instance, we have this uh, fundus photo here you have the optic nerve, you have the blood vessels, you have the coloration of this. These are all things that are very important regardless of what disease we're looking at. In classical machine learning, uh, we have a person, myself, a member of my team, any of the members of the community that do artificial intelligence that are actually writing code that is able to identify optic nerves, identify blood vessels and give them names. We then can use an algorithm that tunes itself to figure out what is the connection between the different features that we are finding. Uh, in order to figure out what we want to do. So for instance, a referable or non-referable glaucoma case. 
but really the magic is done here by the person and their ability to accurately co write code that is able to find specific pieces of uh, the image that is going to be important. Deep learning, as a contrast to that, we now remove that human. So the human has to write a series of code. And basically, we now give a, an algorithm. This is what is referable. This is not referable. Algorithm, you figure it out. Now, that's a very easy way of saying a complex process that we need to optimize. But basically, the algorithm is a series of filters. These filters are, as many of the people, my neuroscience colleagues are probably well aware, are what we call convolutions. So they are um, mathematical equations that are looking for patterns in the data, patterns like straight edges, patterns like colors, patterns like textures in the image. These convolutional filters are looking at smaller and smaller or, or different size scaled pieces. So if you look at this picture of the Sydney Opera House, you're going to have convolutional filters that are going to be finding edges like this, edges like this, the colors, and they're going to be looking at ever more zoomed in pieces. Now, there's a lot of work being done, sorry, on how to actually share all of this information through a network. Uh, but in, essentially, what a deep learning network is, is a series of convolutional filters set up in layers that are looking at different scales of the image. We then look at how do different convolutional filters activate, which ones are important in identifying a referable versus non-referable or a feature versus non-feature in what we're trying to do. Deep learning has several different tasks in a very simplistic uh, way. We have semantic segmentation. This is where we take an image and every pixel that image is going to belong to a class or something that is of importance. So for instance, if we're looking at this cat, you have the background, you have the cat, you have the foreground, but every pixel in the image is going to be assigned to a class. So that's semantic segmentation, semantic being explainable. You also have classification and localization where maybe we don't need to know which pixels correspond to the uh, piece that we want, but we wanna know how many they are and rough, or whether they exist. Um, and, and roughly where they are, but not at the pixel perfect layer. You also have instance segmentation, where again, you're trying to find certain objects uh, within an image, but not necessarily needing to know what's going on in the background. So there's three different types of inputs, times where you can put an entire image being something or not, pixels within an image where every pixel has to be assigned to a class, or instance segmentation where only the pixels that correspond to your object are going to be important. Uh, this is very important because how the network is getting the information to learn uh, is different and how we can now trick this to improve robustness and efficiency uh, is, is different. Now, one of the first tasks where we, we started to take a look at uh, was some work that I did with a company called Vexceleron a few years ago now. Uh, we took a very simple network and we asked the question, can this artificial intelligence learn whether or not someone is going to progress from intermediate AMD to uh, advanced neovascular AMD? Uh, we took a data set where uh, we knew that one eye was being treated. And so we, we had you know, years worth of data in the other eye. And so we found a data set where two years out, the second eye converted, and a data set where at two years out, that second eye had not converted from intermediate to uh, advanced AMD. So we were starting with eyes that we knew that within two years did or did not convert, but at baseline images that we were using for training uh, did not have advanced neovascular AMD. Uh, and so as you can see from these curves, the further the curve gets to the upper left, uh, the better the performance is, meaning that it's finding uh, the ones that did convert and not misidentifying the ones that didn't convert uh, a line right through the middle here would be that it was just by chance selecting it. So um, for instance, with our with the network that we used, we got uh, 0.89 AUC, about 89% of the images we predicted right as being converting, non-converting. Uh, when we did it at an image lab level, if we looked at the entire volume, so all of the images, uh, we actually got slightly better up to 0.91. Uh, so about 90% of the uh, images we were able to identify as being um, converting that would convert in two years. 
uh, when we sent this out for review, uh, the reviewers came back and said, okay, that's, you know, you, you had really good uh, performance here, but what happens if you had a person do it? How well could a, a well-trained ophthalmologist do the same task? Uh, and you probably have already read down below, we talked to several ophthalmologists at different eye leading eye hospitals around the world, and none of them were willing to do the task at all because they said that they had no ability to um, objectively make that decision. So uh, this was a really good show point of the fact that artificial intelligence was able to you know, do a task that could be potentially beneficial for uh, clinical uh, planning uh, that the doctors weren't able to do. Now, it's been a few years since we've done that, but you know, I'd really love to see if any of my colleagues at um, the Moran would be willing to you know, take a look at these images and see if you can predict which ones are gonna convert or not. So we have this great power in artificial intelligence, but we want to understand you know, how can we improve this? This was a great proof of concept, um, but how can we make things work even better? So taking a, a small step back, how does this training that we do in artificial intelligence works? Now, I know some of my uh, colleagues sitting in the, the audience there are also experts in this, and I will admit that this is a very generalized thing, but I think it illustrates exactly the site type of uh, techniques that we were developing and what it can do. So if you start with your collection of images here, we often hear about artificial intelligence being a black box. So in our training, what we are going to do is we're going to take a cluster of images here that are labeled as being disease one, disease two, or disease three. As I talked about, we have all these convolutional filters going on within that black box. And essentially there are patterns within those convolutional filters that are going to be activated. They're saying, hey, I found something here that is important uh, for making that decision. So typically the way training is done is you take a block of images from your uh, collection, you put them through the network and you start this, this process. You then take a second batch of images, you put them, you put them through, and you. Some of these times, you're going to be uh, strengthening that that pathway, that collection of convolutional filters that are uh, important. But other times, if you can see this line, it sees that it has a little bit of a white haze around that. That's illustrating that that first batch of images had information that used those convolutional filters. The second batch didn't, and so. Um, it's a balancing. So as you go through all of your images, you're going to have changing in the importance of these various convolutional filters based on the information that was being fed in in that training batch. Now, so what we did is we said, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of similarities. So you, you look at these first two images here, they have these little bumps. Uh, Drusen, for instance, you know, these images are going to have very similar information. We look through them and we compare them to images like the one over here that has fluids on it, this batch has no fluids on these OCTs, whereas this batch did. So we're putting different information in. And so even though we're trying to train a network to do the same thing, each batch of information going in is gonna have slightly different information. Uh, and so it's not always learning the same thing every time. Now, over infinite amounts of uh, images, it's going to figure out, you know, it's gonna see enough of everything you wanna see, but, we're working in medicine. We, you know, we don't have the ability to have 3 billion images like we have to train a, a car. Seeing a million images is a lot. 100,000 uh, is still a very big number for what we're doing in ophthalmology, or in ophthalmology or even in medicine in general. So can we come up with a more efficient way to, to do this? And so what we developed was the ability to go through and score images as to how important are they? What sort of information do they have? So rather than taking a block of images, going through your, your data set and saying, hey, these images are important. So as you can see that the same number of images per block, but these ones are spread out across having different information in them. We put them into the network, we train, and those convolutional filters are uh, act activated or unactivated, uh, trying to classify into diseases one, two, and three. We then take a second block of images, not just randomly, but targeted as to having uh, different information from each other and mapping the features of uh, the whole data set. And we can see that now we strengthen all of these paths going through um, and we don't have any of that weakening, that, that little shadow that I showed uh, on the first um, 
set of images. So how do we actually do this? Um, what we do is a we take our images, we pre-process to normalize them, uh, and then what we do is a process called Monte Carlo uh, simulation, where we take specific convolutional filters, we turn them off, we run it through, and we look at how is the image being processed differently. From that, we are able to then create a uh, list of the pixels that are going to be important. Uh, important being that the network isn't actually activating very uh, strongly to th those pixels. From that, by doing this multiple different times through several iterations of uh, Monte Carlo dropout, uh, we can now create a standard deviation. So seeing where in an image is a, um, is a network not performing uniformly, we can then sum that and we can create a value to this. Now putting a value to what is the importance of uh, an individual pixel uh, and therefore an individual image from an entire set of, of images. So this can be worked in, in multiple different ways, whether this means the data that we haven't labeled yet for training or in, for instance, in, in the wild where uh, we're seeing patients in the clinic and we can say, hey, wait a minute, this, this, performer, this person isn't performing the way that we would have expected. The AI may not be accurate. So how does this actually work in real life? Uh, we took a series of images uh, of, of OCT images here. And for our training, we did not do any augmentation. So anyone who has done this, uh, has done deep learning, typically talks about rotating images, changing the intensity, changing the brightness, changing the contrast. So our networks were only trained on the native images. We then gave it uh, images that we changed the gamma, we changed the contrast, we changed the brightness. There's a lot of work out there that has shown that if you don't train with that, changes like this are usually going to disrupt them. So we, our network is only trained on the native images, but is now tested on both native intensity and these um, adversarially perturbed images. So going through the system, how did this work? So again, we have these training curves. The higher up you go here, the better off we're performing. So the blue line here is random sampling. So we just took blocks of images, you know, eight images, eight images, eight images. We fed it into the network, we trained it, and we trained it through our entire data set, which is a, a very small data set here. If, if we extended this into infinity, um, obviously we could continue to improve, but we wanted to show how fast could we learn. So for, again, so if all we did was randomly sample at 244 images, we were able to segment them uh, to about 0.8 uh, confidence over all of the layers. Again, rather simplification. But the takeaway of this graph is that by using our uncertainty that Monte Carlo dropout and a similarity metric, we were able to get the same performance with 54% less images. So again, this is really important in medicine where we don't have infinite amounts of data. By targeting and putting a, a, a value to every image, we are able to capture what is going on in a population of data much more quickly with 50% less images. Okay, so we can improve the efficiency, our ability to learn the task with less images. That's uh, the first thing that we wanted to do, but then we also wanted to do robustness. So what we, again, what we wanted to, what we did here is we, we trained with, uh, we trained several different models with eight images, 20 images, uh, 40 images, all the way up to 244. So these are all, each, each one of these numbers is a different model trained only on images that were of the native uh, intensity. So the, the original image up here. We then tested it again against these adversarial images, these images that it had never seen these textures going on. And what we plot here is essentially one minus the performance. So it's the inversion of that previous graph that we showed. And so the closer to zero means that you have no loss. So the lower you go, the better off you are. So again, if we follow this blue line, even at the most, even at our uh, model that has seen the most images, it still was losing about 10% less performance uh, on these adversarial images compared to this trick of on the Monte Carlo dropout plus the similarity metric that we developed that is performing down here. That, so it loses less. What this means is that these models are able to train with less data. And even when they see the same amount of data, they are able to deal with more shifts in the distribution, what could potentially see it in the future. 
So we have a, a much more efficient and much more robust network than what we had typically seen. So this is for the semantic segmentation task where every pixel in the uh, image has to belong to a class and that uh, would then be labeled as being one of the layers of the back of the eye. So, you know, this was fairly easy for us to build out our metrics because every pixel has to belong to something. If we shift this to object detection, we now had an added problem in that our method of dropout and similarity only works on the detections that we're making. If you remember back from those cat pictures at the beginning, um, we are now only labeling parts of an image. And so if you don't find a detection, you can't necessarily figure out how it is going to contribute. Uh, so what we had to do is we had to do an intensity-based uh, mask, then run a series of identifications. And eventually, we were, you know, if we ran enough simulations, we were able to find all, all the objects in, in our images. We have to do this iteratively, but essentially what we were able to then find is we were able to improve, again, the robustness doing a modification of how do we are, do our identification. And we were able to find the same amount of improvements on this new task. Again, unfortunately, the, the colors are, are shifted here. The blue now is the, um, the similarity plus the uh, uncertainty. We were able to learn much more quickly and much more robustly. So by using the ability to put a cost or put a, a value to different images and then figuring out how these images cluster together, we were able to, again, assign a value to every uh, image in a data set, use these uh, add-ons in our training and create much more robust and efficient data. So these are you know, some really great concepts. I just wanted to share as I finish two of the things of how do we actually apply this to medical questions. So one of the models that we used is called Sistain. Uh, this is a clustering-based deep learning algorithm that is very good at identifying what are the pixels that are going to be changing uh, with uh, predicting change within a disease. Uh, and it does it in a number of different ways. It, it does its prediction, but it also is able to um, subtype and classify the stages of a disease. Uh, it was originally developed in 2018 to look at dementia and was able to identify people that were going to be fast and slow progressors within dementia. Uh, using our ability, we were able to apply this to rare diseases, and we were able to show that in under 100 patients with an inherited eye disease, we could predict who are going to be the fast and slow progressors from a single image in time. Um, and identify the areas that we're going to change in those eyes. And so this, one of my postdocs is currently finishing up how to apply this. I would love to, I'm working on getting the data sets together and I would love to start taking the same thing uh, and applying it to glaucoma, looking at um, how uh, based on the surgeries, based on the uh, image metrics of the optic nerve, um, how these things are gonna be, be progressing and see if we can't figure out who are going to be in the different classes, fast, slow progressives, who is going to likely respond to different diseases. Uh, so this is one of the things that I'll be getting working on. Another interesting uh, piece that I've been working on is trying to uh, develop algorithms that are able to predict function from structure. Uh, we know in clinical trials that um, functional tests are always going to be um, ideal, showing how does a person's vision actually change with time. Uh, and so again, using these tricks, uh, we were able to build on work that other people um, had done, and we were able to create a much narrower um, prediction of, uh, so this is now microperimetry, where we have an OCT image, we map the microperimetry test set to it, and we are then able to predict uh, from, the, from just an OCT image, what would the microperimetry be? Uh, we're still working on this. Um, as I said, we were able to improve by about 50% what other people had been able to do with the technique. Uh, but you can see by the distribution here, the agreement between the observed and the predicted, uh, by no means are we replicating uh, an actual human and what they can do, uh, but we are still working on this. I still have uh, a student here in London working on it and, and look forward to building up my team uh, in, at the Moran to continue doing this, that not only predict you know, on a single day, but can we predict how it's gonna change over time 
uh, and hopefully look at ways that we could potentially turn this into, you know, surrogates for uh, clinical trials. So just in conclusion, traditional AI models can replicate a number of the tasks in the, the segmentation, the detection of diseases, uh, but we can also work on completing things that humans not can't necessarily do, the prediction of how is somebody going to progress in the future. Uh, models are very data hungry uh, and need a lot of data. And this is one of the biggest challenges that we have, both from the lack of the humans there, the, the inability to have structured everything properly, uh, as well as the you know obvious ethical concerns about aggregating large amounts of data over many different sites. Uh, the techniques that I showed in active learning uh, can improve data efficiency and have the ability to create um, the more efficient, more robust networks. But also by using that scoring system, we can also teach a network to say, I don't know. We can run algorithms that are able to identify images that are out of distribution, images that it's never seen before, uh, and say, hey, doctor, you make the decision. I I've never seen this. I need to take a break. Uh, and then those last two slides, that's what my FIAT group, the group that I'm setting up at the Moran, uh, building on these techniques, starting to apply them to a number of clinical problems, uh, and hopefully work on creating more solutions that we can hopefully see in the clinic uh, in the coming years. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And uh, if we're able to take questions, I'd be happy to address them. Um, otherwise, happy to have you email them to me. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I can either answer them there or, or continue to meet all, all of you in the near future.